But today I'm going to be speaking about um, the Cantor Arts Center's Asian American Art Initiative, um, which aims to make Stanford a leading center for the collection, display, and research of Asian American and Asian diaspora artists. Um, and I'm going to be telling you um, a bit about the genesis of the AAAI, as we call it, um, because everything at Stanford has a complicated acronym, um, as well as um, some of the things we've been working on. Um, so this is something, the AAAI is something that I have been thinking about really since I arrived at Stanford in fall of 2016, um, uh, right out of graduate school. Um, and I decided that the first class I wanted to teach um, in my teaching career at the university um, was a class that I always wanted to see but never had, um, which was a class on Asian American art. Um, I'm from Southern California originally. Uh, my high school was 60% um, Asian American um, of all sorts of um, backgrounds, which is something we'll talk about um, momentarily. Um, and yet when I arrived in New York, I was presented with a history that felt very different than the one I grew up with. Um, you know, in classes like abstract expressionism to pop art um, or cubism to surrealism, both of which I loved, um, but I always managed to find the, you know, one Asian American woman, um, to write about in all of these classes. So as you might imagine, I wrote papers about Yaoi Kusama, um, about Yoko Ono. Uh, Ruth Asawa was not known, well known at that point, um, at least in the courses I was in. Um, and so this, to create a lecture course, as many of you know, um, is a lot of work um, and it was, even more work um, for this particular topic because I soon realized, um, well, first of all, I had never been educated in it because there were no classes that existed um, in either undergrad or graduate school, um, which was both exciting and daunting. Um, but more to the point, um, it was actually a lot of work just finding the basic information that I needed in order to put together this lecture course. Um, so for example, um, as you know, those of you know, to give an hour and 20 minute, hour and a half lecture, you need, you know, 20 or 30 images, depending on how much you speak about each one. Um, but oftentimes when I was looking to think about the trajectory of an artist's practice, um, I could maybe only find one image and the rest I would have to, um, you know, it's not like I could go to art store or Google, um, but the rest I'd have to do all sorts of kind of basic digging. So an example, uh, the photographer, um, Harry Shigeta working in the 1940s and 50s in LA, part of this great kind of pictorialist group of Japanese photographers working in Los Angeles that um, the art historian Karen Higa was writing about at the time uh, she passed away, um, who is working actually um, with uh, on sets of Hollywood films and creating advertisements such as the one on the right. So uh, Professor, um, I know you mentioned you were writing an, uh, or you're teaching a class on food. I mean, this is something that always blows my mind. It's like the most like gloopy, dis sorry, <laughs> gross to me, <laughs> like American food um, taken in 1940 by a Japanese photographer, right? Um, but this is a work again that, uh, I had to write a museum in order to get a, an image in order to present. Um, and so that was kind of one initial thing was just the, the kind of basic research on so many of these amazing artists um, that remain to be done. Um, the second, however, is that there was um, a small, although very um, rich and deep um, extant, um, body of scholarship by a number of dedicated small scholars, a very small number, um, you know, you could literally count them on your hand, um, who had been working on this really since, uh, for, for many decades, um, and many of them found 
um, you know, the impetus for this work actually coming out of the social movements of the 1960s um, when they were being educated. And so one of the results of this um, is this book, um, Asian American Art of History, 1850 through 1970, um, which was published by Stanford University Press. Um, it's like a giant volume, it's like this heavy. Um, I was actually, I'm not joking you, like using it as a weight during COVID. <laughs> Um, and it is, uh, it's a really remarkable volume. It's, it's the only extant textbook, um, on Asian American art. Um, and I realized that it was co-authored by a historian at Stanford, um, named Gordon Chang, whose father was actually an artist, um, as well as, uh, Martin Johnson, who's one of those really dedicated scholars I was mentioning before, um, dedicated and community-based scholars, I want to say. Um, and the back cover of this book um, is this incredible portrait um, by the Chinese-run uh, San Francisco Chinatown-based um, photography studio, May's Photo Studio. Um, and this is actually the back cover of this book. And I just remember looking at it and just being so struck um, by the application of makeup on this gray emulsion, um, obviously the glitter, very important. Um, and just being like, this is, this is such a striking picture. Where is it? Opening the book and realized it was at Stanford Special Collections, as were all the files for the research files for this book. And so I was like, oh, there's actually a history here at this university that I didn't even realize or know about. Um, and I'll talk more about that um, momentarily. Um, and so it was realizing both the proximity and the distance, I would say, of this history, um, being in places, like being present, but being in places that I wasn't trained to look for things or wasn't expecting to find them. Um, and then as I was going through and teaching uh, this work, I just realized um, how much just this, these artists work have the potential to reshape the way we think about both art history and the lives of Asian Americans in this country. So for example, um, a work by Tamea Kagi, Morning Drawing from 1880. Um, this is, uh, we believe, um, the earliest documented Japanese painter in the United, or in California, um, making a work that really reshaped my notion of what landscape art could be, um, in that it isn't this kind of sweeping view of uh, possession um, and the transformation and parceling of land into a property, which is what I had associated with landscape painting. Um, but it, in fact, um, emphasizes the quails, the presence of animals in the landscape, um, even, you know, playing with the scale in order to show um, uh, you know, their aliveness, their lifelikeness, um, and the kind of cycles of life that the land nurture. Um, or on the right, um, Where is My Mother by Yanji, you know, a picture, um, you know, Yanji, who uh, was a paper son, so an illegal, uh, you know, um, an illegal or a person coming into the United States um, on forged documentation um, during the Chinese Exclusion Act, also studying in Paris, clearly has a kind of Cubist um, visual culture, but is using Cubism, this language of you know, analyzing form, to think about the history of the railroad, to think about the history of diasporic movement. And so, you know, this kind of fracturing of form isn't just a kind of formal experiment, but has to do with kind of diasporic memory and a suturing of history um, and uh, geography together. Of course, 2016, fall of 2016, was also um, the moment when Trump was elected. And that was a moment that I remember teaching, um, you know, I think the week before the election, um, the history of internment and work made in the internment camps. Um, the cover image of Asian American art history, this kind of spectacular flaming sky, um, which is really, I would say, what the sunset looks like some days in California um, over the ocean um, by Chiar Obata is then adapted to show the sky literally on fire after Obata is interned. Um, and you can see the kind of transposition of this motif, um, you know, this kind of glowing sky into this almost blood red, um, um, 
wave of kind of intense um, uh, torment kind of crowning this barren landscape, the barbed wire fences and the guard towers, um, where if you got too close, uh, you would actually be shot. Um, and this was, of course, the same year that uh, Trump enacted the Muslim ban, and it helped us, you know, um, and it helped me think about the history of executive orders, um, executive order 9066 um, being that which um, allowed uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt to uh, incarcerate over 120,000 people of Japanese descent um, on the Western seaboard of the United States. Um, and this being not just a history of Japanese, Amer of, ja of people of Japanese descent in the United States, but also the different histories embedded in them. Um, many of you might know that some a lot of the incarceration camps were actually built near native um, reservations because one of the kind of primary justifications for the incarceration was that they were afraid that, you know, these these enemies, quote unquote, would um, sabotage infrastructure. And so these were swaths of government managed land without a great deal of infrastructure. Um, and indeed, there's a whole history, as many of you probably know, of uh, the incarceration camp at Post in Arizona, where Isamu Noguchi was held, um, you know, being built over the objections of the governing um, Colorado River Tribal Council um, by John Collier, who's then head of um, uh, the BIA. And so these are histories that are kind of embedded in the larger histories of American um, incarceration, colonialism, um, settler colonialism, and are connected to histories that are not just kind of discrete, such as indigenous history, for example, or um, African American history. Um, I also discovered as I was, you know, working on these lectures that Asian American artists have so many different relationships with respect to um, uh, quote unquote dominant narratives of art history or canonical narratives that we all know. Um, so Leo Mino on the left, um, whose work I actually just saw in, um, in New York City makes these gorgeous kind of polyester resin sculptures that are both hollow um, and uh, sometimes filled. Um, he actually taught at Black Mountain College. He went up during the summer um, with Jacob Lawrence and Gwendolyn Knight in the same car um, in order to teach there. Um, and because he was working with um, unusual materials um, very early actually in the 1940s um, before he turns to this, this type of body of sculpture. And um, Leo is uh, in all the Whitney annuals, but two between 1947 and 62, and was actually the person who introduced Jack Whitten to sculpture. Um, or someone like Alfonso Osorio um, on the right from a very wealthy uh, Filipino family comes over to the United States, um, sets up an estate in um, uh, the Hamptons where he actually shows uh, Jean Dubuffet's Art Brut collection to Jackson Pollock, who he's uh, you know, quite um, influenced by. And so he's actually um, a link between um, art brut and abstract expressionism in New York, um, like a kind of post-war art link. And so, you know, these are artists who are right there, right, um, in um, canonical narratives of art history. Shigeko Kubota as well, um, uh, Flux's artist, I just saw her installation, beautiful installation at MoMA, um, you know, um, here uh, creating a work where she's actually um, reinterpreting um, uh, Duchamp's new Descending a Staircase, the painting, which she called Dead, and um, in video, which um, her and her partner Namjoon Paik were, you know, obsessed with as the substance of life. Um, she said she shat video, that a video is her vagina's revenge. Um, and so, you know, here, like the kind of technological and the organic are being, um, uh, brought together as a way of kind of re-enlivening um, this, this uh, Western art historical tradition. Um, and she has a very kind of particular transnational um, 
uh, trajectory as well, you know, born in Japan, working with um, Jap the Japanese avant-garde, also working with Fluxus and so on and so forth. And so the kind of traditional boundaries of the nation state um, often are not adequate to describe uh, the work of Asian American artists. Um, but they also, um, you know, uh, working on this has had me look in places that art historians, as I mentioned, are not typically uh, trained to look. So for example, Tyrus Wong, um, who is a production designer for major Hollywood Westerns, such as The Wild Bunch um, on the left, um, and Bambi um, also on the left, or Jade Snow Wong, who is literally um, a ceramicist, um, an enamel artist, um, and was the first Asian American woman to create a, um, or to write an autobiography in English. I um, mean, here she actually supports herself by throwing pottery in the window of um, a San Francisco Chinatown shop. So very crucially, um, with the exception of uh, Kubota, every work that I've shown you so far, uh, and, and the Wild Bunch still, um, from 69, um, was, created before the invention of the term Asian American. Um, and this is something that I think is really interesting and something for us, I'm sure that we're gonna talk about, um, you know, in the Q and A, is that the term Asian American was actually invented in the Bay Area at Berkeley in 1968 um, as a, means of political solidarity um, with the Third World Liberation Front, um, which was a student strike um, that started actually as um, an anti-war protest, um, an anti-colonial protest um, at San Francisco State College, um, which also turned into, as you will see on the right, um, a list of demands for ethnic studies. This is largely um, considered to be the beginning of uh, what's now known as Black Studies. Um, and what uh, the students, the graduate students at Berkeley were looking for in this term Asian American was, was two things. You know, one, it was to, to replace the um, Orientalist designation of or of um, Oriental, right? And it was also to compile a number of different ethnic groups um, into a single kind of uh, political movement. So that is to say that um, the term Asian American has always been political, it's always been constructed, and it's always been a term of interethnic solidarity rather than one of homogenization. And so in what I just showed you, you know, this kind of um, brief romp uh, through some examples that I just really chose arbitrarily because I love them <laughs> of Asian American art. Um, I think that, you know, the, the, what happens is that even though it seems like an overarching or umbrella term, that term actually holds a kind of infinite number of experiences, histories, um, kind of different relationships to, for example, American colonialism or warmongering, um, to immigration policy. And so that's something that we have really thought about with the Asian American Art Initiative, um, is that in our work, we never want to present a monolithic history or a singular history, but um, it's a kind of understanding that within this umbrella term, once you encounter each of the individual works, you'll realize just how um, how much uh, diversity, how much, how multiplicitous uh, this history actually is. Um, and the other thing is that um, it also tells us kind of histories that, uh, or gives us backstories to histories that we think we might know quite well. So for example, Byron Kim's very famous synecdoche shown at the 1993 Whitney Biennial, the kind of infamous biennial um, that, uh, you know, this was actually the poster image of, um, but what is often, what is not talked about even in the recent reappraisals of uh, the Whitney, of the, of the 93 biennial is the fact that um, Kim's inclusion in the biennial is actually an offshoot of the efforts of um, the Asian American collectivist group Godzilla, um, 
many of whom uh, are still active. Um, today, you can see in the middle, that's uh, Margot Machida, another um, really, like my hero, <laughs> another really important um, kind of historian of Asian American art. And uh, they, after the 1991 biennial, actually presented um, uh, or wrote a letter to the director of the Whitney um, to point out the lack of inclusion of Asian American artists um, and did all sorts of things. You know, there's a whole backstory to this, which is actually um, revealed in uh, a really great new volume by um, the scholar Howie Chen um, of primary documents from Godzilla. But, um, you know, this history of Godzilla actually um, goes back because many of the founders met at Basement Workshop, which was um, a Asian American arts organization that was founded kind of immediately after and in response to the Asian American movement that came about through the Third World Liberation Front. And so there's actually a direct lineage um, between kind of the radical action of um, the Third World Liberation Front and the eventual inclusion of uh, Kim Synecdoche in the Whitney Biennial. And, you know, the tenor of that story and what we make of that story, I think, is still um, being determined. Um, but it's a, it's a backstory that I think is really crucial to fleshing out um, you know, the uh, the importance of politics um, within the museum space. Um, and then finally, I just wanna spend um, a few minutes talking about what we've been doing at the Asian American Art Initiative um, with my co-director, Lisa Alexander, who's um, the curator of American art there, and who's really been working on um, our collections um, and exhibitions. Um, you know, one thing is um, to realize you know, I think that both of us have realized working with a museum and working with collections, um, how fragile this history has been. You know, um, we are going into family homes, we're going into basements. Um, I mentioned uh, there would be a story about May's photo studio, you know, this really tremendous um, a hand colored photograph, which is about my height, actually, um, of a Cantonese opera star, um, was just one of hundreds of works that were saved from a Chinatown dumpster in the 1970s. Um, it's really a story that's akin to James Vandersee um, in Harlem. And what was found was not only um, these photographs, which I believe were advertisements for the Cantonese opera um, in San Francisco Chinatown, which was the primary form of entertainment for um, a, many uh, Chinatown residents at that moment. Um, but we also saw maquettes of photos from the right, which we soon realized were um, darkroom manipulations to bring together families. Um, the men who were photographed in the United States um, and the women because of various restrictive immigration laws um, who and children who are not allowed to be to come to the United States were actually physically being reunited in the dark room. Um, this was also a moment in the 1920s when photography was key to the management of Chinese bodies um, in the United States. You actually had to carry photographic documentation. Um, and there's some evidence that um, May's photo studio was forging some of that documentation. Um, this is, um, these are photographs taken by Elisa of the Michael Brown collection, which uh, this Stanford acquired. Um, it's over a hundred works of historical Asian American art, um, which was being stored in a storage locker um, upon um, Michael Brown's death. And there's all sorts of stories about how he acquired this work, including um, the fact that he would employ a team of pickers at flea markets um, who would have a list of artists to look for. And that's that's part of how he compiled his collection. He also knew and had relationships with the artists. And so, um, you know, we, we soon realized in doing this work, um, there's not only a need for an institution that will preserve this work and care for it, but also um, that will take the archives. And so because Stanford Special Collections already has a strong um, body of material, they've been really wonderful in working with us and have helped us acquire um, not only the works, but the archives of the works so we can actually conduct research on them here. Um, 
as you might imagine, conservation has been, oh, here's some, some more works uh, that are coming out of the Michael Brown collection, just so exciting. Um, Mickey Hayakawa, gorgeous portrait. Um, and uh, George Machado Hiro Hebe, who was also interned, um, you know, creating nudes of um, Asian, Asian women. So I mentioned the conservation needs of a lot of this work, which um, uh, many of you might know, Elise and I have co-edited a special issue on Asian American art of Panorama, which is an open access journal of American art. Um, so Lisa talks about this. Um, but one thing that's been happening is that because of the lack of care and the fact that there is, um, you know, not an easily identifiable institution that a lot of this work will go to, a lot of the work that's been coming to us has required a great deal of conservation. So, um, for example, we were gifted um, this Bernice Bing work, which was, she's, she's an amazing painter. I mean, as you can probably tell, all of these artists have like incredible trajectories that I just want to describe to all of you, but very quickly, you know, a beat, her aunt was a, uh, was a dancer in Forbidden City. She was orphaned. Um, she studies with Saburo, Saburo Husagawa, who's one of the primary Zen um, uh, uh, tutors to the beats, um, is studying with Clifford Still very clearly, um, is an abstract expressionist painter. Um, uh, kind of, she is going back and forth between um, a caretaker at a vineyard and, you know, San Francisco where she's working with communities and making these incredible paintings. Um, this painting, which was a major work of hers was very badly damaged in a fire. So um, Elisa has, um, you know, secured a number of grants in order to allow us to conserve these works. Um, and the estate also gifted us um, her papers or James Leong on the right, whose papers we also hold at Stanford. Um, Leong was, you know, this is another work that is gonna require a great deal of conservation, but he's such an important figure. He was actually blinded in an anti-Asian, anti-Chinese hate attack um, in San Francisco Chinatown when he was young, uh, blinded in one eye, but still becomes a painter. Wins Guggenheim, rents a studio in Italy, which is um, the studio that Cy Twombly is working in um, when he is there in Rome. Um, and so he's, you know, another like really amazing figure making um all these abstract paintings and so that's that's one of the commitments and the things we try to offer at um, a university museum is to really um one provide care for these works and to provide a place where you can conduct actually in-depth research into the into their practices as well and i think very importantly um Elise and I see this as inherently connected to the history of Stanford as well. Um, in that, uh, you know, there's been a big question for us, as I think there is for probably everyone at this moment, is, you know, what does it mean for um, an institution like Stanford or an institution like an art museum to um, be bringing in some of these works that are have have or, or mean so much to the communities in which they come from, um, communities that have often not felt welcomed um, at institutions such as Stanford. And what this has helped us do is really think about um, and really uh, realize that it's part of our responsibility to understand the history of where we're standing um, at this moment. So not only on indigenous land, on Mwekma Ohlone land, but, um, also, the fact that Leland Stanford Sr.'s fortune was made as the president of um, uh, the Central Pacific Railroad, which was one of the um, railroad legs of uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, um, one of the or technologies of American um, empire and expansionism, which was also um, the workforce was 90% was made up 90% of Chinese laborers. Um, who were, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of stories about this, but um, were, you know, as you might imagine, drastically underpaid, ill-treated, um, undertook one of the largest to date um, labor actions um, in the United States um, to strike for fair pay and better food. Um, and who recent archeological work has uncovered actually worked on the Stanford campus, um, tending the Stanford's horses on their farm and planted every single palm tree on Palm Drive, which is the center, the kind of main artery of campus. And so um, 
this is, and their quarters were actually, um, the quarters of farm workers were actually just right around the corner from the canter. So this is something that we have been thinking a lot about is, um, is always talking about this history in relation to Asian American art as not only um, one of the reasons why um, this work needs to be done at Stanford, but also as a way to, you know, um, draw attention to the fact that Asian American history is in some ways the history of Stanford. Um, and then finally, um, I'm going to end with one of the most exciting acquisitions that Elisa has made, um, which is Ruth Asawa's Wall of Masks, um, which are actually masks that she made of every single visitor to, or, or most many visitors to her home in San Francisco. Um, it's this constellation of faces of um, important people in the community of artists, yes, but also activists and children. Um, and this is a work that we're really excited about because we feel like it you know, shows that the wire sculpture of this artist, which are so often, you know, neatly fit into abstract expressionist or 60s kind of gal or 40s and 50s galleries in museums as modernist Black Mountain experiments are not so divorced from questions of community and questions of political engagement. And in Asawa's case, education. And I think we find that in many of the works of art um, and many artists of color um, that, uh, you know, things that I, in my graduate education, have been trained to think of as separate um, engagement with the world and aesthetic engagement are, are, are no, there's no um, division for many of these artists. Um, and then finally, just a couple of events on the horizon. Um, uh, Elisa is, you know, we, uh, we've spent the last few years kind of um, quietly amassing a lot of this work and um, trying to put the foundation in place. And um, next year will be the really public launch of the AAAI, which will include um, Elisa's East of the Pacific, Making Histories of Asian American Art, which will be um, an exhibition of the new acquisitions. Um, and then um, a major symposium on art aesthetics and Asian America um, um, on October 29th through 30th called IMUUR2, which is taken from a phrase by Martin Wong, um, which we feel like captures um, both the togetherness and apartness of, of Asian Americans. <laughs>